70 million American adults with a criminal record. More than 2 million Americans are incarcerated at any one point in time, and nearly 600,000 are released each year. The United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world, incarcerating 716 people per every 100,000 residents. America's inequity is nowhere more visible than in the correction system, where people of color are arrested, indicted, and sentenced more often and more harshly than white people. One in every 10 black men in his 30s is in prison or jail today, and one in three black men born in 2001 can expect to be incarcerated in his lifetime. Upon release, people still struggle mightily to succeed. Policy barriers that restrict access to employment and benefits and the stigma attached to having a record mean citizens continue to pay for their crime well after release. I'm Dakota Palicki, and this is Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent. Today, we will hear from those working to redesign the system and support the millions of people impacted by incarceration. We will hear from Michael Mendoza from the Anti-Recidivism Coalition and about Operation Restoration, an organization that started in New Orleans but it has, has influenced work in dozens of states. But first, we're joined by my colleagues, Dr. Danette Howard, Chief Strategy Officer and Senior Vice President, and Haley Glover, Strategy Director at Lumina Foundation, to give us a better understanding of the landscape. Haley, Danette, thanks so much for joining us today. Really excited to have you both in. And uh, maybe you can just start by, um, you know, why do we think it's an issue and give us a, a better understanding of what the, the impact of incarceration uh, is having on the United States? Sure. Well, what we know is that there's a lot of room for more research, of course, but we, we know that an arrest and uh, uh, time in prison is correlated with lower job prospects. So folks who are coming out of the prison system um, have much higher rates of unemployment. 27% is the last figure I've read. Um, and that many, many folks are long-term unemployed with a lot of people um, unemployed a year after release. Wages are also diminished, as you would expect, without a job. But the jobs that folks are able to get are actually of lower pay um, and are often more itinerant than stable. Um, we also see that, you know, like you said in your introduction, the the price that folks pay, the the debt to society that they pay by spending time um, behind bars is a is a debt that will haunt them for a very long time. So the the lasting implications, and particularly the implications on families, um, are are things that we need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And Danette, I know that you and I have been talking a little bit about how uh, this isn't just about uh, what happens inside, uh, but um, you know, there's. There's a, uh, a broader implication uh, that touches not only those who um, are uh, directly impacted, those who have been incarcerated or trying to reenter, but also the community and their families and the, and the ancillary kind of uh, ex you know, uh, larger growing concentric circles of people who get impacted by, uh, by incarceration. Yeah, that's right, Dakota. So you mentioned that approximately 650,000 people are released from state and federal prisons every single year. And they're going back home to communities and to their families. And in order for them to have a chance at not going back to those prisons, they have to be gainfully employed. And they have to be able to earn a living wage. And in order for that to happen, they really need to have some sort of uh, learning beyond high school. That's what Lumina Foundation is all about for every single person, including those who have had some history with our criminal justice system. And the more likely that those individuals are to get those college degrees, uh, high quality certificates and certifications, the more likely they are to be gainfully employed and to not go back to prison. I think, you know, Dennett, you just made a, a really important connection, right? I was talking to a, a friend the other day and trying to describe what we do at Lumina, which is sometimes difficult. Um, but I mentioned uh, our, our work uh, in this area, and they kind of were surprised. I mean, we're, sure. we're known for uh, having a big audacious goal. Uh, I think people who know us very tangentially think of us like, oh, those are the college people. So, you know, can you go a step further and discuss, you know, why uh, we felt it was important as a foundation to step into um, those who are impacted by incarceration? Yes, I can. So we really believe that in order for people to live thriving lives today, they have to have some learning beyond high school. We know that the jobs of today and tomorrow require skills that 
require learning beyond what you get in K-12 education. So that means that people will need a certificate, a certification, a college degree. And individuals who come out of prison or jail also are going to need those certificates, certifications, and college degrees. And they have to have opportunities to pursue that education while they are incarcerated. And if they've had the opportunity to do that, to continue that education once they've been released, if they haven't had the opportunity to uh, begin that education when they were incarcerated, what can we do as a society to make sure that they do have a chance to get on a path to getting that uh, employment and to getting that post-secondary education once they are released. So our work at Lumina is about uh, post-secondary education, both inside the prison walls, but also re-entry efforts once individuals are released. Mm. You know, and I know we've also talked about how um, a lot of times the metric that is used to decide if we're being successful Mm -hmm. uh, in working with those who are formerly incarcerated is recidivism. And Haley, and I'm sure, Danette, I think I've heard one or both of you say many times that, you know, someone can be homeless and hungry and jobless and still not uh, recidivate. Um, and so one of the things that we've been learning through this early uh, work is, and or asking the question rather, is, you know, how else do we need to um, uh, quantify success uh, for those uh, who are uh, transitioning back into life? Um, and you know, uh, we talked about some of the challenges uh, beyond the four walls. Um, so I was hoping, Haley, you can talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've been learning uh, about the challenges that people are facing. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's a great question. And I think recidivism is the factor that people look at because it's one of the easiest mm-hmm. ways. But in the same way that we measure success for all post-secondary learners, we uh, – an incarcerated learner is exactly the same as a non-incarcerated learner. We measure them by how much they know, how much they're able to do, mastery of competency, completion of a credential. And so those are the kinds of factors we really want to emphasize, along with, as Danette mentioned, the societal benefits, being gainfully employed, having a stable job, coming home to a stable, secure community, being able to provide for family. Those are all American values, and you shouldn't be dis- discounted from those or or uh, discouraged from those because you've had an encounter with the criminal justice system. Um, I had a really great opportunity to uh, trade some emails back and forth with a young woman named Christina who spent some time in Indiana Women's Prison. Um, she's since been released about, about 18 months ago. And she was a – she's a go-getter. She took advantage of every program that any institution she was in provided and amassed quite a few credits. But what happened was she'd been to college before she went inside – And because she was incarcerated, she ended up defaulting on her student loans. Now, there's a program out there that does let you get out of default. You make nine monthly payments of a very small amount of money. But she was routed to three different governmental agencies. And the third governmental agency sent her back to the first one. And imagine doing that when it costs you $10 a minute on a phone call, right? And when you've got limited time on the phone and no access to the internet. She was not able to get out of default so she could apply and keep moving in her education. And now she's out and she's making about 20 grand a year and raising a small child. And so her prospects, because she's still in default, she can't get access to aid. Right? Another, uh, another really poignant example, we all remember the forest fires last year. Well, in California, they did use uh, inmate labor to support the firefighters out there fighting those blazes and they needed them. Right, because those were uh, pretty big, pretty big fires. But when somebody is released from prison because of licensing restrictions, um, they're not allowed to be a firefighter, even though they were doing the job while they were incarcerated, because there's a licensing barrier. So there's a lot of things that we can do as a society to pave the way for all of the talent that is being, you know, incarcerated right now. Let them practice their work. Let them get out of default, especially when it was due to no fault of their own. I'm glad you talked a little bit about um, those are really, uh, I think, illustrative examples of um, the impact that something can have, uh, simple decisions that might feel like uh, what someone might say is a logical policy or a gut test policy. Um, and you know, we've talked before uh, about the uh, barriers that it just takes to even provide a good educational environment while incarcerated. Uh, technology challenges, access to internet, correspondence courses, all those kinds of things. But 
there's also, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the kind of uh, default on the loans because there also was a time when we actually did invest um, in uh, education programs uh, for the incarcerated. And I was hoping you can give us a, an, a you know, kind of a quick background a little bit about uh, not only how that's changed over time um, and then also where we think the nation is right now for an appetite uh, for supporting uh, this kind of work. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so um, with the Violent Crimes Act in 1994 um, took the eligibility for Pell, the nation's largest financial aid program, away from incarcerated learners. And what we saw when that happened was a narrowing of the funnel, um, so much so that we went from thousands and thousands of learners getting access to um, higher education to hundreds. Um, now, because some states have, particularly California, have um, really seen the value of providing higher education in prison, not only for those recidivism rates, because there is a really do well-documented um, correlation, but also because they don't have the talent that they need um, and can't ignore the millions of people who have records, right? Um, we've seen some states re-up and make this investment. It's still definitely not at the scale it was, um, and, but, but it is promising. And there are some kind of demonstrations happening right now. Um, there was a Second Chance Pell demonstration that was um, sponsored by the federal government to have some sites uh, receive some funding to see what would happen, what would those outcomes be if uh, those who were incarcerated had access to um, some federal funding. And so hopefully there will be some evidence that we'll be able to kind of build upon um, the important thing that we like to say, though, is that if there is going to be um, fun funding available on a much broader scale, we also want to ensure that um, those who are receiving the funding have access to high quality programming. Um, we want to make sure that there is a pathway to a credential, not just a course here or a course there or a credit here that is not going to amount to anything um, once those individuals, let's say, are released back into their communities. But we do want them to have a degree or a certificate that they are then going to be able to translate or leverage into uh, a job so that they can earn a living wage for themselves and for their families. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The quality question is is fascinating. I think we've seen, you know, history is rife, of course, with um, examples of very low quality um, education being offered to the most vulnerable members of our society. Um, and we see this all over the place. And prison is no different. And so we've been very interested in understanding what are the characteristics of high quality programs. And they really do come down to exactly what Danette said. When, when we have our, our definition of high quality is that it results in further education and employment, right, for all credentials. The exact same situation applies to credentials earned in prison. What I think is really interesting, though, as we talk about um, opportunities for those who are incarcerated or were incarcerated to have access to high quality education, or we talk about indicators of success for those who are incarcerated or were incarcerated, those indicators are no different um, than they would be for any other individual. And I think Haley said this. And the same is true for standards for higher education and prison programs. They are no different than they would be for quality standards for any other higher education program. Um, we're talking about students. We're talking about learners. These learners and these students just happen to be in prison for a time or have been in prison for a time, but the issue is we still need them to have access to the very best education possible. So we've talked about so far, just recapping our conversation, we've talked about some major policy uh, barriers, both um, at, well, really at all levels, mm -hmm. um, some very practical practice kind of barriers. Um, we've talked about the need to make sure we're providing um, high quality uh, pathways and education opportunities that lead to opportunity to rethink the way that we measure success. Um, so out of the, and, and, and a number of more things, right? Um, out of all of this, what is Luminous play? What is our mm. goal for our strategy? What do we want people to do? And, and how are we gonna go try to make that change happen? Mm. Well, you know, you started by asking why was this important to Lumina? And 
Now, we have a big goal, which is to help the nation realize that in order to develop the talent that it needs, we have to make learning beyond high school a priority for the nation. And in order to meet the goal that we have for learning beyond high school, we have to make sure that populations that have previously been underrepresented in terms of college graduation cohorts more fully represented. And by that I mean African Americans, Latinos, American Indians, and there are other disadvantaged populations such as those who are incarcerated or who have previously been incarcerated. And we know that when we look at our equity populations, uh, black Americans, Latinos, are definitely overrepresented in those equity populations. And so as we talk about equity being at the center of our work, we want to make sure that our work with the incarcerated and previously incarcerated is fully represented um, in that equity work. And so we hope that we will make more people aware of this issue. We hope that we'll make more people aware of the importance of the quality aspects of these issues. And we hope that we will be able to have a fuller conversation of what success looks like and what a thriving definition of success will look like. The only, the only thing I would add to that is that many folks don't fully understand the size and scope of the population in the United mm -hmm. States that has been impacted. So, yes, there's the 70 million you referenced that have some sort of interaction with the justice system. There's the 2 million plus who are currently incarcerated in prisons on the federal and state side. There's another untold number sitting in jails right now. Um, and every single one of those people has a family, has a community. And so mass incarceration affects us all, whether it's directly or indirectly. If we are serious about our talent challenges – we have got no person to waste. Everybody needs a fighting chance, and education is that fighting chance. So that it overlaps with our equity populations means that it is in the core of exactly what we're doing. What we want other people to know, post-secondary institutions, employers, state policymakers, is that ignoring this population is inequitable, it's unfair, and it's not smart. <laughs> because of how many people there are. Um, so that's the only thing I would add to Danette's comments, but this is very important to us, and I think we're very excited to do this work. So I also, you know, when we think about Luminous work, we have the equity imperative. And I know, Danette, under your direction, uh, you are reminding all of us always that uh, every bit of our work um, needs to have uh, the equity imperative uh, show up in a very tangible way. And I was hoping you can draw a connection uh, between this work and Lumina's equity imperative. You're right, Dakota. Equity is at the center of what we're doing at Lumina, and we know that we can't reach our goals or the nation's goal as it relates to post-secondary attainment without focusing on those populations that have historically been underrepresented in terms of college completion and credential attainment. We also know, however, that issues pertaining to systemic racism are as old as, you know, centuries, centuries old, dating back to hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is not an issue that Lumina alone can solve. That's why our partnerships are so important. That's why our relationships are so important. And that's why we are still seeking to learn from um, so many of you out there. That's why we are um, hoping that you will reach out to us and tell us about some of the programs that you are sponsoring, um, some of the uh, programs that you're running, and also um, what you're learning and how it can form our work as well. I'm really grateful that you both came in today. And if, if there's someone who wants to connect with us, is, is there something we can point them to? Absolutely. You can join us online. <laughs> sure. Well, yeah. you know, www.luminafoundation.org. We're both on Twitter. And we would love to hear more about um, some of the good work that's going out there. You know, we've only been at this now for two years. We didn't know much about this space. We've um, developed some great partnerships and great relationships. But admittedly, um, we are still new to this. And so we'd love to learn from all of you out there who are doing great work. So please do reach out to both Haley and me. Haley, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Dakota.
Hello, welcome back. I caught up with our next guests at a recent gathering of state policymakers. Michael Mendoza is the policy director at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition based in Los Angeles, California. We had a conversation about his work to remove barriers for people trying to get education while incarcerated or use their education once released. The Anti-Recidivism Coalition is a nonprofit organization made up of mostly formerly incarcerated individuals, um, and even our staff is mostly uh, made up of formerly incarcerated individuals. And we do very important things around criminal justice reform and helping the returning population with resources such as housing, um, such as educational opportunities, easier access to employment. Um, and one of the other most important things we do is we provide a platform for people coming home to advocate uh, for criminal justice reform changes. And I think that's the most important thing we do as an organization because it allows people to civically engage within their communities. Um, and, and I believe that civically engaging for anybody within our communities is, is really important because you learn so much about what it means to be a responsible taxpaying citizen within our communities. Education within the criminal justice space is huge. Um, I, I don't think we do enough of it as, as a state or even as a movement. And I believe it's very, very important because individuals who are currently incarcerated, uh, trying to prepare themselves to come home, successfully come home and re-enter back into communities, their chances of success increase when they do partake in education, when they are um, able to really take advantage of um, educational opportunities that will give them the skills to access employment opportunities, to um, really make a, a better living than they, what they would have without education. And so uh, within our prison systems in California, we really don't have enough resources going towards education. And I, I think that's one of the things we lack. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is for the individuals, the men and women who are coming home uh, from serving time, we try to put them in the best position to get back into education. Um, even with the barriers around people under supervision, whether it's parole uh, or probation, um, even then there are barriers that prevent people from um, going to school such as the 50 mile radius where uh, people can't travel outside of a 50 mile radius um, for any kind of reason without permission. Um, and so we're trying to implement policies such as um, individuals who are successfully paroling back to communities. We can extend that 50 mile radius which means if they can travel a longer mile radius, then they have more access to different kinds of opportunities, such as education and employment. So I think at the moment, we're just trying to widen up the door, if you will, to educational opportunities that will really help individuals uh, be more successful, gain more skills, uh, and really just succeed out in community. You know, one of the things you said earlier too was um, just that sometimes um, having an opportunity to uh, participate in education programming while incarcerated, it, it actually helps, you know, change uh, the experience uh, for that individual. And I have to imagine it also helps change um, the the operation uh, of the prison environment as well. Uh, taking having people have an opportunity where. Um, they're in an education space uh, versus uh, other ways they might be spending your time. Um, and I guess, you know, um, for those who might be looking at this from a, a non-education lens, but perhaps, you know, I have to imagine that there's other benefits to um, mm. getting folks in education from the perspective of operating a prison. Like, I've never operated a prison, so I'm just speculating wildly here, right? But I have to imagine that there's some of those other benefits to, to that as well. No, thank you for bringing that up. I, I think having education has a lot of different benefits that you can look at. And so I'll use myself for example. Um, before I even thought about taking a college class while I was in prison, um, before that point, I had no hope of ever going home. 
Um, I wasn't really programming. I wasn't taking advantage of the few resources that were offered in prisons. Um, basically, I was just um, an individual who had no hope, who was still angry, uh, who didn't care about coming home, who didn't care about bettering or improving uh, myself to prepare to go home. And so I, I think initially when I did decide to take my college class out of uh, being intrigued, out of wondering if it's just something I can do, um, and just to do something different, uh, I learned it, it changed my life. It, it literally, an educational college class really saved my life. And I say that because you know, looking at my first assignment that my professor had assigned to me uh, in a marriage and in, in family class out of all classes, um, the assignment was for me to kind of write an essay about my life story. And it was an amazing experience because I literally just had to sit there and think about how did I grow up? Um, and how did my family's social history really impact the decisions that I made at 15 years old to commit such a, a, a really bad decision um, that ended in me being tried as an adult and receiving a 15 to life sentence. Like, what happened? Uh, and I never really took the time to, to really think about that until this assignment. And when I was taking my time and writing that assignment and finishing that last page and putting that essay in an envelope where I knew I was going to send it off through mail to my professor and thinking, what is she going to think? I, I couldn't wait to get her feedback and get that grade to see like how I did and was, was the actual insight that I had gained. Um, and sure enough, when, um, when I received that corrected paper back, uh, I read some of the most encouraging words that I've ever uh, received through a letter and, and and she really commended me for for sharing such uh, amazing details into my life um, that I had great insight and she gave me an A plus and so just being able to receive that graded report or that graded essay from a professor who I've never met before uh, who had just read my whole entire life story in a 10 page essay uh, it really felt good. It was encouraging. It motivated me to even do better in class and, and read more for school. And so uh, for me, I think that that was the beginning stages of how important education is uh, for the men and women who are currently incarcerated. Um, from that point on, I, I started to focus more on believing that I could go home, that just because I had a life sentence didn't mean that I was gonna spend the rest of my life in prison. Um, and so my programming started to change. I, I started to actually, you know, pay more attention to detail. I started to actually try to take advantage of any program that was available uh, to prepare myself to eventually come home one day. And, and I, I think that does several things. It, 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 one, it changes the culture in a way. Other individuals who are serving their time with you in these prisons begin to see that, wow, this individual is, is taking college classes. Um, and they look at that as an example and wonder themselves, is that something I should do? Um, but it also sends a loud message to the correctional officers, the institution themselves, when they see, uh, when they see individuals really take their time to do something positive instead of just something negative or nothing at all. And it allows, it, it, you gain a respect from not only um, correctional officers in the institution, but from other individuals as well, and saying that this person is trying to do the best they can to prepare themselves to come home. Um, and so that will kind of encourage the staff to give other individuals that respect and allow them to program as well. So it's, it's a huge culture shift. Um, and it kind of calms things down in the prison system. And what I mean by that is sometimes you'll have prisons that are very violent, but the more opportunities you provide to these people <coughs> while they're serving their sentence, um, the more it gives them something to do, more positive things to do versus negative things. And so education can have so many positive impacts in our prison system.
if we truly believe in public safety, if we really wanted to invest in human lives and protecting lives and, and strengthening community families, then we want to ed invest in education, especially education to those who are currently serving time. Um, because I, I believe that education is public safety. And it's something that we definitely should invest in because if we are helping individuals to really educate themselves and, and, and prepare to re-enter into society, then what that means is that their success rates of re-entering our communities will, will increase and it will lower the recidivism rates. And what does that turn into? That means that we'll have less people going back to prison, we'll have a lower crime rate, we'll, we'll have, um, we won't have as many victims as we do today. And so I definitely believe that investing in education means that we also invest in public safety. Because at the end of the day, we don't want individuals who are not prepared to come home. Thanks again to Michael for sharing his uh, story and perspective with us. Uh, stay tuned uh, for our next guest with Operation Restoration in New Orleans. Welcome back, everybody. Our final guest today is Sarita Stieb Martin, the Executive Director of Operation Restoration. Operation Restoration is an organization based in New Orleans that supports women and girls impacted by incarceration. Sarita joins us today to talk about her work, her story, and her vision for the future. Sarita, thanks so much for, for joining us today, and I was hoping you can kick us off a little bit by telling us about Operation Restoration. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, of course, Operation Restoration is an organization in New Orleans. It was started in 2016 by myself to help incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls transition into society through education. That's and removing as I'm sorry, and oh. removing as many barriers as possible in that process to make sure that they're able to um, attain education. That's great. I know that you do uh, a blend of both, like some direct service, uh, particularly for women and girls, but you also have um, some uh, legislative kind of work going on. You know, I know in our pre-call, it seemed like you were tackling everything. Uh, can you tell us about <laughs> some of the things that you guys are are doing tangibly, just to give listeners a, a good understanding of your work? Sure. So direct services, we always wanted to impact the community in which we came from and um, make the state of Louisiana better as a whole. So the direct services that we provide for women, we have a high sex class in the community, which helps women obtain their high school equivalency. We provide transportation, uh, the money to take the test. We also provide childcare and snacks while they're there. Um, and we wanted to be able to provide this in a setting where we could hold the woman's hand as much as possible so they can attain their high school equivalency. We have a closet which provides clothing of all sorts, sanitary items, as well as hygiene products free of charge for women who have been incarcerated and girls who have been incarcerated. They can come in and get as much as they need, as many times as they need. Uh, one of the things that was really important upon my release from prison after being incarcerated for um, nine years and two months was when I was released, I didn't know what the style was. I didn't know how to buy clothes. I didn't even know what my bra size was and even how to figure that out. So really taking the shame away from not knowing and restoring dignity back to these women, they can come in a safe environment where women who know what they've been going through can help them to get suitable attire for whatever it may be. And we do have social workers on staff that each woman who comes through the door, a girl who comes through the door, they're assessed for the needs that they have, whether that's housing, they need help with employment, they want to go back to school. We keep a running list of all of the services that we can possibly provide in-house or be able to relegate out to our community partners. So there's organizations that can help with them getting a driver's license, child support issues, if they need legal um, help to remove old warrants or anything, we're partnered with a lot of other organizations in the community. We also have a Cans Can't Stand campaign in-house that focuses on transgendered women um, and the crime against nature law in Louisiana and educating the community about how this law has ruined so many transgendered women, specifically of color, lives in the city of New Orleans because it's been used to criminalize people because they're transgendered. Mm -hmm. um, also, 
in-house, we do a lot of legislative and policy work on a state level and also on a national level. So we do a lot of things. Yeah, you guys are quite busy. You got a lot going on for yeah. sure. I was wondering, you know, you mentioned a little bit and kind of alluded to your own personal connection to this work. Uh, and I know it's something that's uh, really important to you and, and formative to um, the creation of Operation Restoration. And so I was uh, hoping a little bit you can uh, talk about how you got into this work in the first place. So when I was incarcerated, it was a really difficult time, but I met some of the most amazing women and had a lot of friends that I made throughout the process. And when I was released from prison, it was due to two women, uh, Victoria Wiley and Latrice Romar Corman. They met me, you know, on the way out and they helped me reintegrate myself back into society. Latrice, who now works for Operation Restoration as well, she helped me with school. Um, paying for books. She helped me to get a job, one of my first well-paying jobs once I was released. Victoria came in and she helped me to get my driver's license, my social security card, helped me to register for school, fill out the FAFSA, and really just walked me through the process. And I felt like the reason that my reentry was so successful was due to these other two formerly incarcerated women being there for me and guiding me through the process. So it was always important for me to do this as well. So I had been doing it on my own, and I got asked to come out and join the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. And that's where my journey began, and I felt like I needed to have my own organization. So in 2016, Operation Restoration you know, was birthed, and then I started working, but I didn't have funding, but I'm out in the community, we're talking, we're putting on symposiums. Louisiana went through this big criminal justice reform push because Louisiana incarcerated the most people in the world and they wanted to make some changes to that system. So just going out and speaking about how we think about mass incarceration, it's focused on men and women are often forgotten in the conversation. And then I had the amazing opportunity. I met Annie Freitas, who is my co-founder now in the organization. She was running an organization called LPEC, Louisiana Prison Education Coalition. She was inside of prisons teaching and just really making a difference in her own way. But I felt like, you know, the organization wouldn't be where it is today had she and I not joined forces, put all of her expertise and my expertise together. And then we have present day Operation Restoration. That's great. I, I think one of the things that I um, uh, really enjoy about your work and your organization is, you know, a lot of times we uh, segment uh, the kind of services that we want to provide to people. Um, so we have those in the world that are providing direct services like the ones you've described earlier. Uh, and then we kind of relegate um, the other more legislative or policy work to other organizations a lot of times. And um, so it's it's wonderful to see um, your organization uh, get so quickly plugged in um, uh, according, you know, and implementing your vision, uh, both in the direct service and Kind of policy arena. And I know one of the early policy wins you had, and I think it was even before Operation Restoration began, uh, was around a Ban the Box initiative in Louisiana. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that work and, and even describe uh, what the Ban the Box, Ban the Box uh, work nationally is about for those who might not be familiar with it. Yeah, sure. Um, so Operation Restoration, we started in 2016. The actual Ban the Box policy work we started doing in 2017 is when we passed that legislation. So it kind of went hand in hand. It was really early on um, in the organization, the formalization of the organization. So when we passed the legislation, I was still working full time at the hospital um, because my professional career, I was a clinical laboratory scientist, but I was still working full time at the hospital and working in the organization full time as well. But we were able to um, get an early policy win. And it was kind of based on the premise of when I first was released from prison, I took college courses when I was incarcerated. And I felt like education was always the key to me being able to have a successful reentry. Like education just really changed my life. And w while I was incarcerated, because the first five years of my incarceration, I was shipped around a lot. And I felt like when I started taking college classes during my incarceration, the trajectory of how I was doing incarceration changed. And I really got to focus on myself and learn things about myself and really learning about how I'm going to show up in the world and what I wanted that to look like. So I always wanted to go to school when I was released. But 
when I got out, I applied to the University of New Orleans and I was denied the opportunity to go to the University of New Orleans due to my criminal history and criminal convictions. And um, I didn't really have a plan B because I don't know what I was thinking. I just never, it never occurred to me that I would be denied an opportunity to educate or complete my education for myself based on me going to prison. And um, it took me about two years before I decided I wanted to reapply. I was married at the time and had had my son. Well, I'm sorry, I was pregnant with my son at the time. And um, I decided to try applying to University of New Orleans again. I used the same application. I just unchecked the box. And for your listeners who are viewers, they don't know, the box is the question on a college admissions application that asks, have you been convicted of a felony? And you have to check the box, yes or no. And a lot of times there's no consistency, no uniformity in the question. Some institutions ask five or six questions, you know, some institutions ask one. So it's no uniformity in how the question is asked, but you have to talk about your criminal conviction. And um, I was denied entrance into the university. So when I unchecked the box using the same application, I got in, I was able to transfer in my credits that I took while I was incarcerated. I got scholarships and just a whole bunch of different things. But my first year in college was, you know, kind of, it was refreshing, but it was also scary because I felt like I was carrying around this big secret. So I decided to tell a professor, I was tutoring chemistry for him, what was going on. And he really helped me to, I guess, come out in a sense about my past. And we really talked about it and we went to the administration and we cleared everything up. But what he said to me was more so, oh, well, you know, you're different. And what that brought me back into the mindset of is that people still have this misconception about who's incarcerated. You know, um, I often talk about not coming from the socioeconomic background associated with prison. When I went to prison, my mom was a judge. My dad was a supervisor in an oil refinery. So it's not like materially we didn't have things, but I was suffering from a great deal of trauma at a very early age. So for me, you know, trauma shows up later and you have to answer to it. So that's how I ended up in prison. And I just felt like, how can you get people to move beyond this, you know, misconception of who's incarcerated and allow people to get an education? So I started talking about my struggles with being able to obtain an education. And since I had obtained an education, how successful I had been. And I just wanted everyone to have that opportunity. So we um, drafted legislation with Representative Vincent Pierre and um, Edward Ted James, Representative James from Baton Rouge and Pierre's from Lafayette. And we were able to get the legislation passed and it became law in 2017. It's really great. And, and, and I, and I really want to thank you for sharing a little bit more about your story. I mean, it's, you know, uh, in, in its simplest form, right? You uh, are incarcerated, you're taking college classes and getting college credit uh, and putting in the work. Uh, they're just as uh, high quality as anything else that uh, you'd get outside. Um, and uh, finally, upon release, you go to continue education, uh, but simply because uh, of a criminal record, um, you, you were denied. You were denied the pathway to, to continue on. And uh, I really appreciate your... Um, uh, your willingness to share with us too that, you know, upon second application, everything's the same. You just uncheck the box and uh, sure enough, they they welcome you with open arms. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there's probably a lot of folks that are making that call, uh, whether or not they should check the box uh, or not check the box. And I know that, uh, you know, on the next kind of horizon, you've been successful in helping other states ban the box um, and get rid of the box, including Louisiana, building on um, your success there. And I guess as you're looking towards the future, uh, what are some of the other big priorities that you have uh, coming up? So we definitely have been able to move the legislation into the state of Washington, which was successful in 2018 in removing the question off their college applications, as well as the state of Maryland. Um, and we work really closely with Novest and San Andresi in those two states to, in order for us to be successful in those policy wins as well. But what we've done is on a state level, we are bringing the legislation to nine states this legislative session. We've already went up in Virginia and we uh, lost in committee. But the great thing about the state of Virginia is, is that they're open and now they're calling and they want to discuss and talk and figure out how we can get it done for next legislative session. We have a really positive outlook in places like Colorado and Georgia. We're bringing it forth in Texas 
and a few other states um, this legislative session. But we're also looking on the federal level to what other barriers to education exist. And we are now working on calling for a clear strike of the Pell ban. Um, some misconceptions that people have is that a certain select group of people cannot obtain an education. And really, the only people that cannot use the federal funding for um, Pell in order to receive the education are people who have been convicted of a drug crime. So uh, people have this you know, notion that you know, the most heinous crimes can't use Pell funding, and that's not true. The only people who are relegated to not using uh, federal funding is people who have a drug conviction and some sex offen some sex offenses on a very minuscule level as far as like they can't utilize it while they are um, under like a mental institution or somewhere where they have been committed, you know, to do time other than prison. So those are very specific demographics that are not able to utilize FAFSA. So for us, it's if you can utilize the FAFSA um, information, question 23 um, is the, the drug conviction question that ha makes people ineligible for Pell. If we are able to utilize Pell as formerly incarcerated individuals once you're released from prison, what is the problem with getting the education earlier on? So right now, striking the Pell ban means that people who are incarcerated cannot use Pell funding. People also associate that with if you're using Pell funding, then my child who has not done anything wrong or, you know, in the eyes of society is losing on Pell. And that's not how Pell works. You know, Pell doesn't work based on the amount of people that need it that particular year. Um, so having students who are incarcerated utilize Pell takes nothing away from students who are going to college in a traditional sense outside of prison. So we're really working hard on removing um, and a clear strike of the Pell ban and also removing the question on a federal level as well. We had a win last year, last legislative session, where the common application has decided for the 2019 school year that they are voluntarily removing the question off the common app. So we um, all know that we don't want it to be dependent upon who's in office or who has the decision-making power at that particular time. We want it to be legislated where your criminal history doesn't come into effect um, for admission into universities. That's great. Well, and congratulations on all the progress that you've been making. And I know that you have a, a, a tall order in front of you uh, for the continued work. If uh, some folks want to learn more about um, Operation Restoration and your efforts, uh, where, do you, uh, where do you suggest they go to? So we do have a website. It's www.or-nola.org. Again, that's www.or-nola.org. And on the website, you can just find information about all of the programs we have locally, all of the work that we're doing nationally. We also have a page on the website that we have formerly incarcerated women who are now business owners and entrepreneurs or authors. And you can find links to buy their products and also donate on the website because we are 100% donation based and all of the money goes back into the organization. And also 80% of our staff is directly impacted by incarceration. So we really, really um, love your support. And I'm just so happy that I had the opportunity to speak with you today. I really appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure's all ours. And thanks so much, Sarita, for, for joining us today. Uh, we're looking forward to staying in touch and uh, talking to you again soon.